Hi everyone. Welcome to today's session with HubSpot. Um, this is Anna Gordon, who we have on the call. So Anna, Anna managed the HubSpot for Startups program for HubSpot. Um, and today's se uh, session is going to be on email marketing. So it's going to be a really relevant session to uh, everyone who's here today. Um, so my name is Nena and I'm the senior marketing executive here at Republic of Work. Um, so again, email marketing is going to be interesting for me as well. Uh, we just have a little NPS survey that we like people to fill out for each of these sessions. Um, it just helps us, um, you know, figure out how we can improve on these sessions. So I'm going to pop that into the chat. And if people could please just fill that out at the end, it literally only takes 10 or 20 seconds. Um, and it just helps us figure out, you know, how to improve these going forward. So, yep, that's just going to be all for me. And I'll pass you over to Anna now, who will take you through the session. Thanks, Nana. Uh, thanks, Darren, for joining. I know we're after um, a bank holiday, so thank you for joining after your Easter break. I hope everyone had a good one. I know we um, delayed the session from before, so thank you for joining. Um, and just to kick off, so yeah, as Nana said, I'm Anna. I manage the, um, the HubSpot for Startups program for UK and Ireland. So I manage our partnerships with lots of exciting VCs, accelerators, incubators, and co-working spaces. And before I joined HubSpot, I worked at Enterprise Ireland for over three years. So I'd be very clued into um, the Irish startup um, ecosystem. So yeah, if I can help with anything, if you have any questions, please let me know. So just to kick off um, in terms of what we'll discuss today, so we'll be going into a little bit on how does email marketing work? getting started with email marketing, um, how to build your email list, email regulations and email marketing analysis. So there's a lot to cover today. Um, I'll probably cover it in about 40 or 45 minutes and then do pop your questions into the chat and then we'll address as the end about 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, so just to kick off, so just to put things into a little bit um, of context. So the first marketing email was actually sent in 1978 and resulted in 13 million in sales and kicked off what has become one of the most highly used marketing channels even to this day. So we often think of some, or sometimes that one of the misconceptions about email marketing is that it can't, it's spam. And of course, if you're getting loads of um, emails on like things that aren't relevant and you're, you know, adjusting all your Gmail filters to that or things are automatically going to your spam, that can be the case. Parts of it can be spam. But really, your customers don't give their information lightly. And if used right, email marketing can really be both a relationship building and a profit building tool. So that's the key thing. If it's used right, it can be um, really great for ROI. So first day all to go into how does email marketing work? So there are actually 3.8 billion email users worldwide. So if you're looking for a way to reach your customers, email is a perfect place to find them. There's lots of opportunities there. So you should use email to build upon an existing relationship with your subscribers and leads by providing relevant, valuable information that will help them take action on their goals. So first of all, just to kind of start off, um, email marketing can be quite broad. So just in terms of some of the key ways that you can use email marketing. So first of all, to build relationships. So build connections through personalized engagement. Um, when you're in your early days, maybe as a startup, can, you know, maybe you can have all those, those personalized engagements with tons of prospects or, you, you know, when it's like when you have less prospects and less customers, but as you grow um, and as you, as, as you grow and scale, it's really hard to always have that really personalized one-to-one -one approach without using things like email marketing and other tools. Boosting brand awareness, so keeping your company and your services top of mind for the moment when your prospects are ready to engage. Promoting your content, so using email to share relative, relevant um, blog content or useful assets with your prospects. Generating leads, so enticing subscribers to provide their personal information in exchange for an asset that they'd find valuable. So this is, I'll go into like a bit on, um, on lead capture forms and things like that a bit later on. I could do a whole other session on inbound marketing and creating useful content. That's something that HubSpot has lead, has lent into since we first started and something we continue to this day. Market your products. This is specifically kind of um, more on the product marketing side, so promoting your products and services. But again, doing this not in a way that's kind of uh, leans into the email marketing as spam kind of thing, promoting it in kind of a more helpful way and also having that balance between kind of helpful content versus pure um, promotion of your products. 
nurturing leads, so delighting your customers with content that can help them succeed in your goals. So I know I said there are generating leads, but also things like nurturing leads. So say, for example, um, Cubs Software Startups, so if we do like a webinar um, and we have our own landing page for that, we might send like a lead nurture thing after that. Or if you're, nur if you're nurturing people in that way, so you can provide um, nurturing content in like an automated way as well. That's just kind of a high level. So getting um, started with email marketing, just to dive in a bit deeper here. So creating an email marketing strategy, I'll go into each of these um, in a bit more detail. So these are kind of the key steps. I know it can be, um, be overwhelming, but you have, to, you have to start somewhere. So here's a few kind of um, tips and tricks for getting started with creating your email marketing strategy. So first of all, define your audience, establish your goals, create a way for people to sign up, choose an email campaign type, make a schedule and measure your results. So first of all, um, define your audience. So this is something that um, we focus on um, a lot in HubSpot, the age old thing of like customer is king, still a chance to today. And since the beginning, we focused a huge amount on um, our buyer personas. And this is important for any content you're creating or different marketing campaigns you're, you're doing. And that is inclusive of email marketing. So what are buyer personas? For those of you, I'm sure some of you created them, maybe some of you haven't, depending on the stage you are at in your company. But buyer personas are semi-fictional representations of your ideal customers based on data and research. When we first started um, HubSpot as 15, it was 16 years ago now, we're in 2022, um, we were purely an inbound marketing automation app. We had one buyer persona, it was Marketing Mary. We were targeting um, marketers in like the small biz segment. And we chose that one. Now that persona has evolved, it's called Marketing Michelle. Um, she's, she's moved up, the persona has changed. So basically what I'm trying to get at here is um, create your personas will change over time, but really helpful to create these when I, just to really focus your campaigns. And that will also lead into segmentation, which we'll talk to in a bit. So I won't go into this too much detail. We have a great make my persona tool there, which you can use. It, can it creates a helpful graphic for doing that. But basically, when you're thinking about your persona um, development, and again, this will be different depending on um, the industry that you're in um, and your sales cycle and things like that. But essentially, when you're developing this, a few kind of key questions to ask, you know, so who are your customers? How old are they? Their job role, their experience, um, personal things as well, challenges. We'll keep some up at night. So really detailing and listing out every um, detail imaginable. So... Step two, um, establish your goals. Sorry, one sec. Um, so I'll go into these a little bit more in terms of in, in more depth later in terms of the specific KPIs to set. But what are your actual goals? If you're sending, if you're if you're if you have a new kind of email marketing strategy, um, what are your overall goals for that? Do you want to increase subscribers? Do you want to increase your email list? And then at a micro level as well. What is your goal um, for each campaign? And also a, a helpful way of looking at this as well is looking at um, benchmarking yourself against industry averages. So I'll send um, a more detailed report on this, but this is kind of um, mean open rates and click-through rates kind of by industry. So good as well, whenever you are establishing those goals, um, what are kind of the industry averages that you can benchmark yourself against as well. So you have lots of more people um, entering, it's good to see. Um, creating a way for people to sign up. So I'll go into some more detail in terms of growing the list, but how are people actually going to sign up so that you can contact them um, in a GTPR compliant way? So you can't really do email marketing without people to send emails to. So creating a way for people to sign up. So I'll go into um, lead capture and opt-in forms in a bit more detail later on. Um, choose an email campaign type. So there are tons of different email campaign types. Again, not to get overwhelmed, you don't have to do every single one today. A couple of examples are new content announcements. Do you have a new piece of content that you want to promote to your followers? Product updates, um, digital newsletters, co-marketing emails, event invitations, welcome emails, lead nurturing emails. Depending on your stage, like you might want to test out different different um, different ones. You might want to just have um, you know have a new to start with, and, and again, you can get more scrappy at this depending on the stage of your company. 
and your budget. Like I've seen startups do, um, you know, videos on their LinkedIn as little product updates and then have like webinars they promote through LinkedIn as well. Like those are, they're free kind of organic ways of doing this. So don't, and like the one that you choose is very subjective because it's dependent on your individual um, business and what might work. But yeah, don't be afraid to kind of test, test these things out, see what might resonate um, and kind of, and start there. Making a schedule. Um, so really you want to also make sure, so if you're doing, if you've picked from here, if you've picked um, the there, yeah, a newsletter, you want to your um, your audio want to establish kind of a regular cadence with your intended audience, so that they expect the same content. Um, say if it's a newsletter, are you going to send it on like the twelfth of every month? Um, and really having a calendar so that it's not um, kind of a one so once off thing. So that would be an example for um, a newsletter. When are you actually going to plan this out rather than just being kind of one off things that don't have um, a plan moving forward. And then measure your results, really important to measure that. I'll go into this kind of at the end in terms of email marketing analysis, because there's a bit more um, to kind of to say on that. So how to build um, your email list. So I have um, a bonus resource there, a blog that I can share again in the resource after the event, um, but how to build your email list. So there, you're, again, as I said, you can't uh, do email marketing without people to actually send emails to in a privacy compliant way. There are a lot of creative ways to build your email list and purchasing emails definitely isn't one. I think most kind of reputable um, email marketing providers actually will uh, stop you from being able to um, send emails to purchase lists. So like I think in HubSpot, like you're not allowed to do that. Um, so yeah, purchasing emails isn't a good way of getting it. Also, you might not have, they might not be your right target audience or maybe they are, but they're going to be annoyed <laughs> if you try to um, just do that. And I, I'm annoyed if I get an unsolicited email. Um, so don't try to purchase email lists. Um, the golden rule for this is, um, and it can be, it's not just for email marketing, it's quite, quite a broad golden rule, um, but see if you can add value before you extract value. So what are you offering someone in order to extract the value of um, getting their, their personal information? So what kind, of, what kind of value are you actually offering to them? So really list building comes down to two key elements, which are lead magnets and opt-in forms. So try to use um, to so use different ways of using lead magnets. So some examples of these are it could be again dependent on your industry. There are a variety of different ones here. You could use um, an ebook, a white paper, um, an infographic, a report or a study, um, a template or a webinar or a course. Again, depends on your individual company, um, your buyer persona, and things like that as well. Um, blogs work particularly well as well. Um, so yeah, it really depends on where you're at for that. So how to create a great lead magnet. So make your offer really, and I'll show you a couple of examples just to bring it to life in a second, but make your offer um, solution orientated and actionable. Um, ensure that the asset is easy to consume. So don't make it really um, jargony, make it really um, accessible. Create your offer with future content in mind. So that's why I said about not doing like kind of one sort of random uh, marketing email, especially if it's like a newsletter or something like that. Like if you if you have a plan um, in mind of, oh, I'm going to do um, some content for companies that maybe are more in the awareness stage of the buyer's journey, and then maybe people who are ready to purchase, like keep in mind different content that um, you might be able to create in the near future. Treat your lead magnet as a stepping stone um, to your paid solution. So even if it's more like educational content um, in the beginning, why like why are you investing time in creating this content? Make it a stepping stone to your um, paid solution and create offers that are relevant to each stage of the buyer's journey. Um, so the buyer's journey is awareness, consideration, and decision stage. And wherever, whenever we're creating content in HubSpot, like if... Um, if someone's only in the awareness stage, they don't know what a CRM is, they don't know what HubSpot is, they don't even know what their problem is. We don't want to be um, sending them loads of marketing, nurturing emails that are sending them pricing pages and things like that. So making sure they're creating different offers, say for like lead nurture campaigns and things like that, they're relevant to each stage of the buyer's journey. 
So when you talk about um, kind of trading value before you extract value, so this is a really early, um, say the later stage in a second, really early stage example um, of a kind of a lead magnet that helps back grade. And you can see um, a form there as well. So it's the ultimate uh, kit for convincing your CFO of the value of inbound. So um, yeah, as you can see there, someone is exchanging um, their contact details in exchange for um, this kind of guide. It's a piece of content you're offering. You can see there you have the CTA um, subscribe to HubSpot's marketing blog. In this case, they asked for, we asked for the email and the phone number. I'd say usually um, in a form, sometimes it can be harder for someone to give their phone number, particularly in my, maybe not everyone has um, a work email. It's much easier to get someone's email. So probably all, wouldn't always have um, a phone number there, depending on the content offer. And then you can see here, this is one of our, um, so I'm just gonna take this order. This is one of our current um, content offers. So as you can see here, um, there's CTAs everywhere. Get a start for HubSpot free, get to HubSpot free. So there's three CTAs there. And there's another one uh, kind of for contact support. If you scroll down, there will be even, um, even more of those. I think there might be a form at the end of this page um, or a form if you click on the CTA. So just think of that, that flow there and how you're getting that, those details. We also use, um, you can see like a chat bot in the right hand corner there. So we use um, chat bots a lot as well on like high intent pages. That's something you can try for free um, with the free version of HubSpot or with other um, their providers as well. So another way, another kind of kind of potential lead capture one is something like a value calculator. Like I see these a lot on like mortgage websites and stuff like that. So again, you're giving value because someone wants to see, calculate what they might be able to afford or find the right mortgage. You're giving them a free piece of content in exchange for me giving you my details. So that's the kind of the value trade there. So then when you're thinking of, so here's a bit on lead magnets, then when you're thinking of opt-in forms, so how are you gonna get that information to actually be able to bulk up that contact list. So a few things to kind of to keep in mind. Um, as I said, maybe for the first off, it's just including like first name, last name, um, email. We include those kind of basic fields um, for things like webinars and things like that. Um, so create an attractive design and an attention, attention grabbing header. Um, make the copy relevant to the offer. So don't be going, going crazy doing completely different copy in comparison to the offer. Keep the form really simple. So as I said, like even like, yeah, first name, last name, email, um, and ensure the flow works. So always be kind of testing it, um, even just fill out your personal email or a colleague's email just to make sure um, if someone goes in, like if, if they go on to, um, the lead capture content page and then they click that CTA or they download the form, like what does that flow look like? So do a little audit um, of the flow yourself and just make sure that that works. Sorry, just So and so add those forms um, essentially to pages to get the most traffic. You don't have to add it to every, um, every single form, but if you have, depending on how much content you have built out or that you wanna build out, um, just making sure that you're adding those forms there, or if like it's a little simple newsletter sign up form, having that embedded as part of your website. As you can see here, here's a, just a little GIF of the way um, form building works in HubSpot. Pretty simple drag and drop there. We also have a drag and drop editor for, like, for our email marketing builder and things like that. So you can very easily add, um, yeah, these, these kind of contact properties here, first name, last name, et cetera, depending on the kind of details that you want to get from them. But as I said, keep it simple in the beginning, trying not to uh, like ask them for a million things unless um, depending on the form and the intent behind it, but I would keep it simple in terms of the information you're asking them for in the very beginning. So how to send marketing emails. So first of all, very basically, um, if you haven't already used one, if you're evaluating a new one, choose an email marketing service, use email marketing tips, implement email segmentation and personalize your email marketing. So I'll go into each of these now. So choose an email marketing service. So um, you want a CRM platform with segmentation capabilities. So if you're gonna be able to store that contact and company information, be able to like 
send them nurturing mails, everything like that, you're going to need um, a CRM platform, especially with segmentation capabilities, because I'll go into segmentation in a bit more detail in a few minutes. But if you want to be able to segment by you know, the life cycle stage or where they are at in the buyer's journey or segment by different um, buyer personas or build different lists, things like newsletter lists and things like that, you want to be able to make sure that you have segmentation capabilities. Um, a service provider that has a good standing with internet service providers, a positive reputation as an email service provider. These are kind of obvious ones. Easy to build forms, landing pages, and CTAs. So as I showed there, like how are you going to capture um, that leads information? Um, automation. So if you do want to have, um, if someone say fills out a form on your website, if you want to automatically um, enroll them in like a need nurture flow campaign to try to get them to do your desired service. So say if someone um, fills in a page and then you want to send them a series of like three emails to try to get them to book a demo or something like that, you're not going to be able to do that um, or it would be very hard to do that manually yourself. So being able to have some sort of um, email marketing service provider that has kind of workflows built up so you don't have to do anything like that. Um, once you've you know, built it out. Um, a service provider, I'll go into GDPR in a bit, but that provides kind of simple ways to help you comply with email regulations. Ability to A-B test your emails. Um, some sort of built-in analytics. You can see, like, if you, if you set those email marketing goals, um, kind of seeing, you know, what's not working is your open rate down being able to actually have some sort of reporting or dashboards available on that so you can actually see what's wrong so you can invest your time um, in the right place and then kind of tacking on to that kind of downloadable reports for those for those analytics. So a few kind of email marketing tips if you're sending for those kind of individual emails. So for your subject line, um, use clear, actionable, enticing language that is personalized and aligned with the body of the email. So um, I can go into the, in, the, in the KPIs in a bit, but basically just making it kind of attention grabbing, not using things that might pick up um, pick up someone's spam filters and automatically put it into the spam. We're also even like getting creative with it. Like we use um, Vidyard a lot in HubSpot, which is a kind of like a video platform. You can send like two minute videos from it. I think, I don't have the exact stats to have, but I think we find that if someone, if the subject line is, hey, I made a video for you, if people on our sales team are prospecting people, the open rates um, are, very, are increased exponentially because it's like, oh, here's a personalized thing for you. So if you can't even get someone past the subject line, um, they're not going to see your email, obviously, or, or click through that. So just um, making really clear, actionable language, or if you're promoting a webinar, um, if you have a really exciting speaker, putting that in the body of the subject line, things like that. Copy. So the copy in the body of your email should be consistent with your voice um, and stick to one topic. So I think it's important to have this kind of consistent brand. If you're, you know, doing lots of different bits and pieces of marketing and you're not staying consistent with your brand, just make sure, make sure that you are essentially. Um, images. So choose images that are optimized for all devices. They're eye-catching and relevant. So don't just, it's a good to include an image to make it more, the um, email more digestible, but make sure it's, you know, obviously relevant to the content that you spent the time on that. And also you don't want it, um, you know, if it works on a desktop, but then someone opens it on their mobile um, and they can't, they can't see it or it's blown up or pixelated or something. Um, keep in mind your, your call to action. So it should lead to, you know, the CTA at the end of the email should lead to a relevant offer and stand out from the rest of your email. So depending on, um, depending on the kind of campaign you're running, like if it's a newsletter, you might have a CTA um, at the end of that, like for our, if we're sending, say, or say if we're sending in HubSpot, we're sending um, emails, we might have like a CTA at the end of apply for HubSpot for startups, but it could be different for you. It might be, um, here's the demo or apply here, like whatever it is, it really depends on the type of email campaign that you have. Um, but yeah, make that, make sure there is, there, there is a CTA in there. Um, timing, so based on a study, um, Tuesday at 2 a.m. is the best day and time to send your email. Um, so avoid things like, 
you know, I don't know, Friday afternoons or times when people aren't, wouldn't be at their desk. And you can also, um, if you have kind of scheduling software for that, like say for HubSpot, you can, um, you can schedule to send an email, like if you're not going to be in the office, but you want something to go out at a certain time, you can pre-schedule um, that email to go out at that time. Responsiveness. Um, so 55% of emails, this, as I said, I kind of talked about images and mobile, but 55% of emails are opened on OMA, a mobile. So your email should therefore be optimized for this. And again, depending on um, the service provider, uh, like in HubSpot, you can see it'll automatically show you what it would look like in mobile, but just making sure um, that that's optimized for that. That's not gonna look uh, funky when someone opens their phone. Um, and personalization. So be personable and address your reader in a familiar tone. I think I'll go into this in a bit more detail in another slide, but things like, again, your, your email marketing service provider can probably help with that. But um, like if I get an email that says, hi, Anna, just a bit more personal and you can do things like that, but things like personalization tokens. Um, so you're not gonna be able to actually make it personal in a non-automated way, but there's way, ways that you can automate it with things like personalization tokens. So implement um, email segmentation. So each person who signs up to your sees your emails a different level of readiness to convert into a customer. And the more you segment your list, the more trust you can build with your leads and the easier it'll be to convert them later. So um, you can segment your list um, by you know, geographical location, life cycle stage, um, where they are at in the buyer's journey. So awareness, consideration, decision stage, um, their industry, previous engagement with your brand. So when I talk about this, like if you've um, got cookies installed, you can see if they've like been viewing like five pieces, like loads of your content in the last while, um, their language. So if you work companies both in say UKI, but also Germany, you don't want necessarily people to be receiving things in the wrong language and their job, job title. So this can just kind of help for, if you have like a specific say, um, Newsletter list, you can always make sure that you're enrolling them in the newsletter um, for that month or things like that. Um, or if you have certain people who are only in the consideration stage, they can go into certain like automation flow as well. So you just don't want to, um, I suppose it depends how, how large your email list is and as you grow it over time, but segmentation can just provide a much more personalized um, experience. So. We talk about um, kind of personalizing your email marketing there. As I said, there's a few um, kind of ways to do this. I already touched on the first one. Here are a few ways. So add a first name field in your subject line and or greetings. So as I said, like if I get one that says, hi, Anna, I, I kind of know now that it's, it's not real. It's just um, the automation. You can basically just put in hi and then the personalization token is just first name. And as well, like um, you can put in like company tokens, so it'll pick up automatically. Like if I was sending um, email to Nana and I had a company token, it would automatically come up for public of work because it's pulled that from our email. So you can make that kind of um, personalized and yeah, and or greeting. You can include um, region specific information um, when appropriate. Um, you can send content that is relevant to your lead's life cycle stage. So I said, like, are they in, um, are they qualified lead or not? Or where are they in the buyer's journey? Or you can only send emails that pertain to the last um, engagement a lead has had with your brand. Um, write about relevant and our personal events, like region-specific holidays or birthdays. So if there's particular, um, you know, Easter offer that you want to send out at that time, um, or if, you're, if you have loads of Irish customers and you want to do a big um, Paddy's Day thing or something like that. Um, end your emails with a personal signature from a human, not your company. So even if, um, like my emails will be signed Anna, but say even in, in email marketing, like that would usually, um, like someone from our, um, from our HubSpot or Startups marketing team would sign up, make sure that all the email marketing things are signed in their name, just to look like, even though it's like that email might've gone out to, um, over a thousand people, but they can still see, oh, it's from someone, it's from a human, it's not um, just cheers from HubSpot, it's actually from um, a human. And then use a relevant CTA to an offer that the reader will find useful. Um, sorry to kind of mention CTA, so I won't go into that too much more. Um, so email regulations. 
So there's lots of different, um, I'm not a privacy expert, there's lots of different uh, privacy laws depending on the markets you're targeting, but obviously the huge one for us here in the EU um, is GDPR. So GDPR is about giving your customers the right to choose. They choose your emails, they choose to hear from you, they choose your products, and that is exactly what inbound marketing is about. Um, so as I said, that's what HubSpot was signing on, the whole inbound methodology of being human and helpful and giving customers a choice. So as you know, I'm sure everyone knows what GDPR is at this stage, but um, obviously it only applies to businesses that operate in the EU and businesses that market to EU citizens. So again, uh, full disclosure, obviously not, not an expert, you should have your own GDPR strategy around this, but here's a quick overview of how you can comply with GDPR laws. Didn't think I could do an email marketing session without touching on this a little bit. <laughs> um, so firstly, use explicit and clear language when requesting consent to store personal information. Only collect contact data that is necessary for and relevant to your business. Store contact data in a secure manner and only use it for the agreed upon purpose. Retain data for justifiable purposes only. Delete contact data on request. Make it easy for contacts to unsubscribe from your list or update their preferences and comply promptly to a contact's request for access to their data. So what I will notice, like I know that that, that seems like a lot, um, but if you are using an email, like depending on the email marketing provider you decide to go with, a lot of the time they'll have like, oh, like, op, like you have to have your own strategy and consider it bro more broadly across the business but often they'll have things set up to say, oh, opt into GDPR, so that in marketing emails, there's always gonna be like an opt-out option or in one-to-one -one sales emails, um, there's an opt-out or you have to um, have like enable, um, like say that you're able to con leave just viable purpose to contact someone or things like that. So even though there's a lot there and you should consider it based on your individual company, depending on, as I said, the provider you go with, some of that can be built in, which just makes your life um, easier and it can be like automated in that kind of way so that you're complying where you can. So avoiding spam filters. So if you spend lots of time creating the perfect email and then you, you know, adhere to GDPR uh, regulations, you've crafted this gorgeous email with lots of nice graphics and CTA and it's all perfect, but you don't want to um, end up getting put in a spam fold, um, you know, a spam folder then. So you want to um, get whitelisted. So Rob, that's the opposite of getting um, blacklisted. Mind your copy. So I think, let's see if I can put this. Um, I just have a blog to put in. Um, so there's just a few um, examples of spam words um, that can trigger you going into the junk folder. So avoid, you know, like lots of capital cap letters or things like words like free um, or loads of exclamation points, like crazy punctuation, things like that, that could potentially put you um, into, this, into the spam filter of someone's uh, email account. So there is, I put in one there, that's like the ultimate list of, I think there's like a few hundred words on that. But the good news as well is you don't have to, like it's good to just have an idea of a few of them for when you're crafting emails but any good kind of email marketing service provider will also give you like um, a nudge, uh, like if you're writing the copy and then they're like, oh, maybe don't, like content suggestions basically make, oh, maybe don't include this word uh, because X, Y, and Z. Um, using a reliable email service provider, again, because that will help you with things like that. So you're not manually doing it all yourself and implementing a double opt-in. So you probably like have noticed this from any Anything you sign up to, um, basically where you sign up uh, on some on a website or a landing page or whatever, um, and you have to confirm, you get an email to confirm your email, and then you have to click on the email, the link, and then go back. So that's basically is that that double opt in. So I think this is one of my last ones. I know I'm at one thirty four. So email marketing analysis. Um, so A-B testing your marketing emails. Once you have kind of, again, you have to build your list there, have some content to promote, trying out the email campaigns and things like that. 
But ultimately, if you want to kind of see if your efforts um, are worth it, you want to really A-B test your marketing emails once you have a good, um, a good test, like a good test, a good amount of um, emails to test this with. So A-B testing, also called um, split testing, is a way to see what type of email performs best with your audience by analyzing the results of email A against email B. So how to A-B test um, your emails. So, you know, you don't want, again, that's why I said you don't want to do this with like, um, you know, 20, 20 contacts. You want to have a good, like maybe at least a thousand um, to actually kind of test this with. So select one variable to test at a time. So the downfall might be you send an email, but you've um, you've changed a bunch of things. Like it's going to be really hard um, to measure that if you've changed subject line and CTA and images. Just pick one to say if it's um, the subject line, if you have a different subject line in one email versus another one. And then create two versions of the email, one with and one without the variable. Allow your emails to be sent out simultaneously for a period of time and then analyze your results and keep only the version that performed better and then try to test a new variable um, and repeat the process. We do this a lot um, in HubSpot and HubSpot for startups. But yeah, just testing, as I said, just one variable at a time. That's, that's the key thing. Don't try to test everything at once. Um, setting, if you're analyzing your emails, setting your marketing KPIs, these are kind of the key four ones to pay attention to. So deliverability, um, so that measures the rate at which emails reach your intended subscribers inbox. Open rate is the percentage of people that open your email once it reaches their inbox. So again, if you're, if you have like a good, um, subject line, like that'll help with that. Click through rate is the percentage of people that click on your CTAs and unsubscribes measures this, the number of people who opt out of your email list once they receive an email from you. So a couple of ways to kind of potentially improve on these results if you've, you know, if you've done some tests and you're realizing your delivery or one of your KPIs is really down. So how do you actually start to improve on that once you have that data? Um, so I mentioned someone deliberately there already, but following best practices when it comes to avoiding spam filters. So um, looking at that, that kind of subject line, making sure you're not being uh, denounced to the spam builder in Gmail or Outlook or whatever service provider. Removing inactive subscribers and bounced addresses. So if you can see the, the emails that have bounced, kind of removing them. Um, open rate. So adjusting, a couple of ways to do that is adjusting your subject lines uh, could get better results if you, if you change that, if you make it a more enticing um, subject line, like I mentioned before, and sending emails at different times. So really looking to those, those optimal times, uh, like I said, like if you send on a Friday afternoon, so it might go on, you know, go on the weekend and then never read it. Um, click through rate. So if someone's yeah, opening up and not actually clicking through, you might want to evaluate your offer. What kind of content are you sending? Rewriting your copy to ensure it's clear and actionable. So not having you know, a bunch of, of a really clunky paragraph um, that's, yeah, this could be have spelling mistakes or whatever it might be. And then trying different CTAs. Unsubscribes, um, a few things to consider are evaluate whether email you sent is aligned with your brand. Ensure you haven't kind of performed a bait and switch by promising one thing and delivering another. So you've given that uh, value add to someone and then they um, they give you their details, expecting something in return, and then you don't give it to them or you give them something completely different. Like that will probably annoy them for future content offers. And make sure your emails are kind of providing value to your audience before trying to upsell. So yeah, again, if someone's in like that awareness stage, send them loads of resalesy content, uh, probably won't resonate in the beginning. So ton of content. So just to note a tiny bit on HubSpot and HubSpot for startups before we open it up for Q&A. So HubSpot, for those of you who aren't aware, is an all-in-one CRM platform. So we're designed to help you optimize each stage of the buyer's journey. So the journey that someone goes on from knowing nothing about your product or service to hopefully converting to um, you know, a prospect to a customer and then a promoter or evangelist of your product or service. We have um, a free CRM and then we have kind of five separate hubs to help you manage each stage of that, that buyer's journey. So marketing, sales, service, um, CMS and ops. 
And this series is presented to you by Hope Stop or Start. So as I mentioned, I'm Anna, I manage HSFS for uh, UK and Ireland. We offer educational resource and tailored training, so a bunch of helpful content um, for startups. Also do like kind of larger scale webinars. And then for some of our, our lovely partners like Republic of Work do um, sessions like this. The integrated platform for startups, so a ton of um, integrations it's actually, as a 300 is actually over a thousand now. And then we have professional software at startup pricing. So by being part of um, Republic of Work, you could be eligible for up to 90% um, of HubSpot. So I know there might be some people here who aren't part of Republic of Work. If not, you can still, you might have one of our other partners. So you can apply on HubSpot for startups and select it there. If you are part of Republic of Work, uh, we will share the unique partner link after this um, with you. And we also have weekly startup office hours um, if you're interested in learning more about, about HubSpot. Um, and there's a few extra resources there. And yeah, I've talked for far too long, so I will see. Um, I love enough to questions. <laughs> Thanks a million for that. I know Anna is really practical and informative. I definitely learned a few things as well. <laughs> <Nice>. um, <laughs> so if anyone has any questions, you can either pop it into the little chat um, or else if you want to just like raise your hand and say one over the screen. Um, I do see one was here from Mim O'Flynn's asking, was the video creation tool called Figyard? So it's Vidyard um, or we use Loom as well. Okay, perfect. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Um, I know there was a lot covered, but I find, um, especially with this kind of thing, it is great to look back over the slides and kind of just get more familiar with it. Um, I think even from my own experience, email marketing is definitely like a bit of a learning curve. You kind of just have to do it over time. And once you start seeing results yourself, um, you know, it's a lot more encouraging to keep, you know, learning and everything. Um, so I think Alicia has a question here. Does HubSpot have a tool that will calculate the amount of customers that unsubscribed or opt out? Yeah, so I would say probably just um, you can just filter that, like depending on um you can just filter that based on a list. So you just would segment the database and then just see who unsubscribed and then you just be able to filter by unsubscribes there. Yeah, perfect. Uh, I think Jason there has a question. Hi guys, how are you? Uh, thank you so Hi much. You. That, was, that was super informative. Uh, really so much information. I'm still- I know, there's um, loads. <laughs> that was um, I, I suppose I just have a question around, gen I suppose building that list. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose for me, that is something I'm finding difficult um, and around. So, I mean, I get the idea is to create content and put it out there as a, you know, as a value add. Um, mm -hmm. Any kind of thoughts on that process or where you might actually put, I suppose, how do people find that content? Is it, are, are you solving particular problems or? Yeah, I mean, it, what, well, what does your, what does your business do? Can I ask? I'm a psychologist. Um, You're a psychologist, okay, yeah. nice. So not a therapist, I'm more around the performance and, and development side of things. Um, but yeah, so I book loads of material, but it's kind mm -hmm. of a case of, of, I suppose, trading that for those names, you know? Yeah, yeah, I suppose um, a few things. So making sure like that the, the search engines can find you. So optimizing that content for, for SEO um, and a service provider can help you with that, can provide, can send more details on that. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, getting that content out on things like LinkedIn and stuff like that as well. And then if like, it's depending on like, because your field, like, is there particular um, forums you can join um, that basically the people that you're targeting that you can kind of add the content to those as well. Like for HubSpot, like say our, if we're targeting, you know, marketers or whatever, we target um, forums or community groups um, that will be in, within that. So kind of targeting those groups as well. I suppose there's no there's no silver bullet answer, but I suppose that's kind of making sure you're optimizing your site for SEO um, and then kind of sharing that content. And then, yeah. Um, Nana, is there anything that's worked for Republic of Work or anything that you'd recommend to add there? Um, well, yeah, I suppose if you were talking about how like struggling to actually build the list, yeah, I think it's something that maybe it's just kind of a long haul thing you kind mm. of do have to, it's, it's not gonna, it's not something that's gonna happen quickly. It's definitely gonna take a while. Um, and I suppose, yeah, if you're a psychologist, maybe if you have like, yeah, if you do, I don't know if you have a newsletter already, but I would definitely recommend like just having something you are sending out regularly. So like if you're doing something consistently, like, I don't know, 
obviously I'm not sure what particular area you're in but like even if it's just little tips or like um you know just easy digestible kind of things nothing too yeah, you know overwhelming like I send out a weekly email a couple of different kind of different resources usually like a book recommendation um maybe some content I've made myself uh upcoming events etc but try to keep it short and kind of you know because I'm sure people are sick of listening to me on one, on one <laughs> level but I suppose it, it's in terms of building that list it's it's that's something I'm finding difficult uh the open rate the click through rate is quite good on it it's I suppose just getting the numbers and and what that process might look like but I'll start having to look through some of the, the hub stock hub spot articles I'm sure there's, there's plenty there in terms of how to build it um yeah I think I'm just missing a little link you know yeah as I said it does just if you want to build it organically like it does it does take time um so that's the thing as well sorry it's not a perfect answer <laughs> no not at all thank you so much <laughs> no worry uh and there's another question here uh how does email compare to on-site chat bots in terms of engaging users um I suppose they're they're quite different beasts. Um, I don't know have any like stats on engagement rates or anything like that. But with email, like you you have their details already, you're sending them maybe to segmented groups of lists and things like that. Whereas with chatbots, um, they can have different use cases. Like it might be if you put a chatbot on like your pricing page, you could ask some qualifying questions before sending them to sales. Or you might be just uh, sending people content directly. So they're they're very different different beasts um, in terms of of that. They can help to create like collect contact data. Um, so I'd say they should be used. They they're, they're they're so different that they should be used kind of side by side. I wouldn't really necessarily compare the two unless it's, it's a very specific use case for chatbots. Yeah, and just on chatbots, you kind of want to make sure that you have either like the proper automation set up or else have like the personnel there to manage mm. it because you know I've definitely been on websites where they say they have a chat bot but you know it's completely it's not like, yeah <laughs> yeah you still want someone like when it comes to it uh that they can be be connected uh yeah yeah perfect um so that is it if anyone has any other questions um I'm just going to pop in our MPS survey again if you could take two minutes or two seconds to sign that up um, and thanks to a million to Anna for today's session. Um, slides are definitely really helpful. HubSpot has so many tips. I've definitely used HubSpot throughout uh, since college and even still today, I still use it for little tips and stuff. Um, so yeah, definitely take a look into HubSpot for startups as well. Um, so yeah, I don't think if there's any other questions. That's probably it for today. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. Perfect. Thank you, Anna. Thanks everyone for nice. coming. Bye. See you later. Bye.